tool to kind of figure out where to start with this, you very quickly understand how the data is structured. And it allows you to go back to the Yang specification, which is, once you've kind of figured it out, not really that complex, and, and see how these models actually drive configuration inside of the controller on the devices and any plugins that you might build. But again, it's on the fly. So if you bring in another model, you'll see it appear in, in Yang UI. There's another flavor of that called API docs. So people say, where's a lot of the documentation for these, these models? Um, you know, I don't really want to go through the model or dig into the device. API docs allows an extraction of the documentation from these models and auto-generates the documentation. So it's, it's a URL inside the controller and you get documentation for the models. But it also includes a way to try out these models. So you know, if you've got an interface configuration model and you want to say, OK, let me pull out giggy interfaces, you can just press a button and put in the interface, and out will come the result of that model querying the device. So it's, it's a pretty powerful tool. And that's a relatively recent feature. One of the big barriers to entry for open daylight walls, it's, you know, version one was version one. So it was very hard to understand how to consume this thing. So it's been made a lot more user and developer friendly. So where do you get it? Well, it's, it's open source. So um, you got, there's two kind of very straightforward ways of getting into open daylight. There is um, a zip file, which is essentially, you can just download the zip file, unzip it. You need some Java environment to run it on. It could be Oracle, it could be open Java. It, it, it works on both. You then essentially run the executable, and uh, up it comes. It comes up in its own shell environment. You can then install the features you need. If you want to get to it via REST, you install the REST feature. If you want an HTTP feature, you install that. So it's, it's pretty straightforward, and that is good to go. So um, uh, today it's Helium, which is SR3 is the release. Next month on the 24th will be Lithium, which is uh, another substantial move forward in, uh, in the process of open daylight. If you're a developer, there's many ways to do this. We could endlessly list this. But what we tried to do is produce something called Core Tutorials. It's work in progress, but it's a set of tutorials to teach you how to build open daylight. And to get you up and running, they're using the sort of more of an archetype feature. So there's a template in the background from the repository where you bring down a subset of all the things for the controller for the startup project. And the wiki walks you through piece by piece, not just how to do it, but what exactly you're doing. If you press this button, what does it do and how to, how to configure it? And you end up at the end of the archetype with you can build a very simple RPC, just a Hello World RPC. And it shows you exactly how to build that. You can then get into a far more complex programming. So the rest of Core Tutorials goes into uh, much larger archetypes. If you just want to build the code, then you can just pull down the source code and just take it from there. But it's, you know, with, if you just want to play with it, if you want to figure out where to start, there's a bunch of tools. If you're already a Java programmer and you need minimal documentation, take the source code. L most of the documentation is in the code itself, and the wiki's getting better all the time. I'm not going to say it's perfect, but it's, it was pretty terrible. It's now a lot better. It's still, it's still got a way to go. So for those who have not seen Open Daylight, um, you just got a very brief introductory video of what happens when you download it and boot it, just to give you an idea of really how simple this is now. And I cannot see the screen. Got a lot of videos. Sorry. User error. Sorry, I'm just going to mirror it just so it works. Well, maybe not. No clue. There's, there's, there's no way to start the video without it moving to the next slide. Ah, OK, we'll do it the hard way. OK. I'm just going to show you the video. That's the easiest way to do it.
Okay. Just, it just won't. That's fine. Are we good now? Sorry about that. So you download the distribute? <laughs> Seriously. Do you want to gather around my laptop? This might be the only way to do it. No, what's, how does your projector work? It works everywhere else. Okay, we're going to have to skip it. Okay. We'll just, so, we'll have to skip it. Okay. Uh, why Okay, we're gonna have to skip the video, I'm sorry. It's, it works on every projector in this place except this one, so I apologize. Um, Giles, do you wanna talk about NetConf Yang? All right, cool. Tab right. Yeah, so, um, apologies if any of you have heard this before. Oh, we're good, we're good. Um, you know, one of the key internal mechanisms within Open Daylight that pretty much drives everything is Yang models. Um, and that's common actually to a lot of things we're doing within Cisco. So we had some discussion at a panel earlier today about how it also applies to um, NSO, uh, which is the product that came from the TLF acquisition. Uh, and also more and more we're putting Yang models into our devices, um, starting with XR but moving to other devices as well. Um, and Yang came out of a network management effort in the IETF. Um, where they invented the network, the NetConf protocol, which is simply a transactional protocol for configuring devices um, and for accessing data stores that live on devices. Uh, and that NetConf uses XML encoding. So the basic NetConf Yang stack looks like this. So you, you typically run um, SSH at the bottom layer. You can run TLS as well. It's actually quite a good debugging thing when you're setting up open daylight, you know, things go wrong, adding nodes. One debugging tool you can use is you just do an SSH minus P830, you know, username, app device, minus S, netcom. What happens then is your SSH client logs into the router. As soon as you put your password in, the router thinks he's talking to a netconf client, and he gives you back all of the Yang models he supports. Now, you need the right snippets of config on the device for that, and we can give those to you. Um, in fact, what we're, what we're starting to try and do, um, I guess we're mentioning the, the whole sort of uh, devnet and developer.cisco.com type effort, um, I'm starting trying to blog and put these up there. Um, you know, the, tip, the hints and tips of how you make this stuff work. Um, finding them in the blog proves quite difficult, so I think we might need better indexing on the blogs, but I'll make sure all those snippets are there. Um, just because from a diagnostics point of view, it's good to be able to, I guess most of us as network engineers, we kind of, we don't trust the GUI, we don't trust the controller, we want to get down and see what's actually happening. Um, so, so I find that helpful. And actually, Andrew has some good sort of cut and paste scripts that we showed on Sunday, where you actually cut and paste stuff in, responding to the NetConf server on the device as if you're a client and get it to do some stuff. Um, it gets tricky because unfortunately, the, the encoding that got picked for NetConf 1.1 is this chunked encoding where you have to calculate how many bytes of data you're sending. And doing that from the CLI is a pain. Um, and then the NetConf operation, so it's based on XML RPC. So remote procedure calls, uh, and then netconf operations get built on top of that. So get config, edit config, um, requesting subscriptions to notifications, that sort of thing. And of course, you have things like commit and rollback. And this is where you get into the whole ability to do distributed transactions across the network by editing, say, a candidate data store, making the changes at both ends, and then committing the whole thing as a distributed transaction. Um, as I mentioned, XML encoded, and on the top layer, the Yang models describe that data. But we then came and said, well, what, we think this is great, but not everybody wants to implement a NetConf server, particularly if you're talking to something like a controller, where a lot of your operations are never going to be distributed transactions because you have one controller. So you know, if you, you think, well, we could do that with something simpler, like a web API. And the nice thing then is we make this accessible to web developers. Um, web developers you know, tend to want web protocols. The thing you also find, unfortunately, is they don't like XML much, or most of them don't. Um, and what everyone wants to use now, you know, the cool kids use JSON, apparently. Um, somebody said on stage the other day that, you know, we should have Python coders against, against XML. So the thing being that Yang is just a modeling language. You do, it just describes a data model. So it doesn't have to be encoded as XML. You could encode it as JSON, so we do, or anything else. So the ITF is also working on something called I2RS, which is a, an effort to do something a little bit more like OpenFlow for anyone who's, who's heard of OpenFlow, which is kind of the, the canonical SDN protocol. 
Um, with ITRS, the idea though is instead of accessing the forwarding, you know, the FID on the device and going right into TCAMs on the box, what you're doing is interacting with the rib layer. Uh, so things like static routes, ACLs, etc. What we, well, ACLs are TCAMs typically, but it's at that slightly higher layer of abstraction than OpenFlow. The challenge is we need that OpenFlow, OpenFlow style performance. So in open daylight with OpenFlow, we can run, I think, 140,000 flows a second. Uh, persuading an XR device to do that with NetConf is going to be interesting. So with I2RS, we're looking for lighter weight mechanisms. So still Yang models, but instead of using XML over SSH, we'll use something more compact and binary. We'll avoid storing to flash across different RPs and just stick it in DRAM on one of them, that sort of thing. Um, and then finally, in open daylight itself, having had this great opportunity of Yang models down to the devices, what we did was we put them all the way through the controller. So in the beginning, open daylight, uh, we had something called ADSAL, the application to find SAL. So effectively, interfaces between components were hand coded for that. With the model driven SAL, everything is a Yang model. So if you write a plugin, like an OpenFlow plugin, you don't just write the code to manipulate the OpenFlow protocol, you write a Yang model to describe what that plugin does. That Yang model then gets consumed by the model driven SAL. That then provides Java APIs for applications but also REST APIs that we'll show you in a moment. So as, as Andrew already mentioned, I think, the, the unusual case is NetConf, where we're getting the models from the device instead of from the plugin. Um, and in fact, we use that in a strange sort of reflexive, if that's the right word, way uh, to configure Open Daylight itself. So Open Daylight has a NetConf northbound sitting on top of its own NetConf data store, which is how we configure it. And this came with Open Daylight Helium. In the original hydrogen release, everything had to be done through a config file, which is a pain because if you want to change the configuration, you ended up having to restart the server. With this config module approach, you just use literally um, something like either a Python or Perl scripts or something like that, or equally just Postman or REST client from a browser. You just post in or put in that configuration change you want to make, and it takes effect immediately. So how that works is you communicate via RESTConf. RESTConf through the NDSAL is automatically translated to NetConf. And all you're doing on the RESTConf API is specifying which NetConf device you're talking to. And then when, when we mount that data store, in this case our own data store, uh, you have this YangX mount which says I'm going to somebody else's data store, not my own. And in this case it kind of is my data store because I've connected back to myself. Um, and we use this config modules to actually post that data in. So then the next thing is, well, how do we, what you would do there, for example, is you'd say, OK, I've got a bunch of XR routers in my network. I'll post for each of them to add it in, because we don't yet have auto discovery for those. That is coming with NetConf Core Home. But right now, it's always the controller as the client connects to the router as the server. Uh, and when it does that, what happens is it will discover, as I mentioned, with the SSH minus P830, the first thing that happens is the device tells you all of the models it supports. And we basically pull those into an inventory that we keep within the controller. Uh, in the next release, Beryllium, that's moving to be a topology for some arcane reason. To me, a topology should always have links. And a topology that's just a list of nodes isn't really a topology. Um, at the moment in Lithium, we have both. And that's sort of how a lot of things are happening, is that we kind of introduce something new in one release, but we don't retire the old thing until the next release. So we provide that kind of overlap. Um, and I guess the same with the MD SAL. As of Lithium, the release that's just coming out, the old AD SAL is deprecated, but it won't actually be removed until Beryllium, the fourth release. Um, some of you may have noticed I'm quoting elements from the periodic table, and that's the naming convention we picked. Um, we didn't alliterate like everybody else, but they're not ice creams or um, rivers or, you know, they're, for some reason, elements. Um, da -da 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 -da. So the next thing you do is you actually pull in those models if you don't already have them. So it might be the first time this controller instance has ever seen an XR device. The XR device, if it's 531, has 46 different Yang models. I think 44 of those aren't already in the controller, and they will all get pulled in. So you can do a, a get schema, find out what the models are, pull them in, put them in a cache. Connect to another XR router, again, put them in the inventory, but probably, oh, sorry, I've stepped on too far. Probably at that point, what you'll find is that the, um, the models are exactly the same, because say they're both running 531, so you don't have to update the cache. When 532 comes out in a mixed network, what you might find is that some of the models have been updated. And in that case, that's where this comes in. 
When we store models, we store them with a revision date so that if there are changes, we'll know the changes. Because the important point is, if I'm the management end, I know the models, the device knows the models. If our idea of the models is different, things are going to go horribly wrong. But then with a different device, so we've worked with the OpenWRT guys. If any of you know that platform, it's a kind of uh, Linksys Netgear type operating system. It now runs NetConf Yang. So that would have an almost completely different set of models to XR. But then configuration, what do we do? So we want to configure a device. We connect through. And what you find is that I've got the right number of these. Oh, I've gone too far, sorry. We. Oh, sorry, I went too far. Yeah, basically, we post or put two that config modules I mentioned. A, a two. We post the config modules to get it in. And the next step, at that point, that device is going to appear in our inventory. So now we can get to that device. But again, we see this Yang X mount that says, I'm going to something external. Only now the external thing's actually a, a router. And we're going in there. We've learned what models it supports. If I put something in here that wasn't a model it supported, it would go wrong. And if I put something here that wasn't a top-level container in that model, that would go wrong. But having done that, we can go down, and these URLs can just get longer and longer. Did we have that video today? Oh, no, we don't have videos. <laughs> I knew there was a problem. Um, I can maybe show on my laptop in a bit. Um, and the URLs can just get longer and longer as you kind of step through, and you keep going and keep going until you get to the most atomic entries of data. Uh, and you can change things, but again, also, you can just retrieve stuff. So with RESTConf, um, all it is, as, as I mentioned earlier, really, is a way of doing NetConf over HTTP, supporting JSON as well as uh, XML. There's a fixed, a fixed set of rules, really, for how we map between HTTP operations and NetConf operations. So for example, an HTTP GET, which after all is all you can do from a browser, is either going to be GET or a GET config in NetConf. The choice of which one to do depends on whether you're going through an operational tree or a config tree in RESTConf, which we'll come on to. Um, the funny thing, actually, though, is that um, with our RESTConf implementation in Open Daylight, config is always the running data store because we don't do distributed transactions. There's no need to have other candidate data stores. And in fact, if you read the NetConf, um, sorry, the RESTConf uh, RFCs, um, yeah, it's NetConf, a get on the operational, um, if you do an operational get on the config data, on the config data it is a get on the running uh, config, so you get the same data back. Um, but what the get opens up is these whole other data stores where we have statistics. Um, and then you can see all the others there. So you need to post or put to change things or delete to delete things, and we'll show you that. Now, those, of course, get mapped differently if what you're talking to underneath isn't a NetConf device. So I was going to show a demo in a bit with um, OpenFlow, and in that case, you're accessing just your local data store on the controller. But as I said earlier, that maps to um, the plugin, which it itself is Yang models. And so you'll be creating flows and open flow, deleting flows, that sort of thing. So this is where you're going to show a video, presumably. OK, we'll skip through that. Um, I could show the open flow thing. Um, and then, yeah, Charles, if you want to come up here as well, and then we can, um, let's do open flow. Then we can show the DevNet stuff, uh, and then Q&A. That might work. This is the bit that'll probably go wrong. Um, if anyone who was here, I'll remember it was this morning or yesterday, yesterday, uh, the demo gods were frowning on me, and it didn't work. Um, first thing I have to do is log back in. Yeah, sure. Far right away, and then I can get this ready. Good. So I said we'd do Q&A, so we've, we've done a couple of sections, so I guess now's probably a good time to ask if anybody has, yeah, are there any questions? Excellent. Okay, it's a gentleman with a microphone. Thank you. Go. Test. Uh, question, what's the difference between TLF and Open Daylight? It's a very good question. So um, first question is, uh, one is paid for and one isn't. Um, so second. But, but it, the reality is, so uh, TLF is much more of a, a service orchestrator. So Open Daylight doesn't do service orchestration at this point. Um, it's, it has a relatively similar framework in terms of it has southbound plugins. You know, it has a REST API interface at the top. It has the concept of being model driven. 
But as Giles mentioned about MD Cell and the fact that if you give something in open daylight, if you give open daylight a model, you don't have to write any of the bindings at all to get the APIs out. Um, so that's, that's kind of one of the key differentiators. It's, it's more of a, it's in essence, an AD cell model, somewhat instead of, in, I can't speak today, in, in, in uh, tail F. But I think the two things work very well together. There's a lot of, you know, which one's better, which one's best. It's like, well, they both perform on some level a similar function, but on the open source side of it, of course, you can bolt in any plugin you want and anybody can contribute to that. And that's what we're seeing from the open daylight point of view is a massive expansion of southbound and northbound applications because it is open source. But you can also drive TLF with open daylight. So from a Cisco point of view, if you have a lot of devices that you know, aren't netconf yang, and which, let's face it, at the end of the day, most of the stuff out there is still iOS, then you've got a great plugin for open daylight or a system that sits on the side of it that, that can be controlled one or other. So there's, I think, that's probably, it's probably a reasonable explanation of it. I mean, everybody's kind of like, well, which one? It's like, well, maybe both. Depends on how you're going to set up your orchestration. Yeah, and I, I mean, I would characterize it, well, I always characterize it as there being sort of three things TLF does uh, through their product, you know, and, and NSO, uh, none of which Open Daylight addresses. One is um, this CLI mediation that Andrew talks about, so the ability to talk to a non netconf Yang device. But in many ways, that's a short to medium term thing. You know, the long term, hopefully, all the devices will be netconf Yang. So you think, well, what, what, what benefit does it give us then? Well, there's two things very closely related, I think. One is the those distributed transactions I talked about. And the other thing then is because you have this ability to do distributed transactions across the network to set up services, et cetera, they also have a very good service modeling capability where either declaratively, if the, if the service is relatively simple, or imperatively using Java code, you can implement a service and have a service model which then maps onto those device layer models. Open daylight, you could in Java, uh, you know, again, imperatively write a service model, but we don't really have the wiring there to support that the way that the way the Tele product does, and we certainly don't have the declarative way of doing it. Um, so literally for simple services in, in Tele, you can literally almost build them. You, you pretty much, it's like taking a diff of, this is what the router looks like before I add the service, here's what it looks like after, and just the wiring from one to the other and you're done, and you haven't written any code. Um, and so that's you know, obviously a very powerful way of looking at things. Um, and just very much then that ends up becoming the configuration tool of choice. Um, whereas, you know, where we're, I guess where we're positioning Open Daylight here is much more around dynamic things. So the fact that it talks BGP and PSET, that lets you talk to topologies in terms of IP networks and program paths. Then with OpenFlow, again, that's like, now you can run a canonical STN network composed of switches that run OpenFlow. Um, I mean, personally, you know, there's Lisp as well. Yeah, there's many, yeah. many plugins. I mean, I'm not personally a huge OpenFlow fan, but I'm working with one or two customers who want to use it, and they have you know, niche use cases where it makes a lot of sense. So with the switch network, where they want to know exactly what the latency is, exactly what the path is, OpenFlow is a great way to do that. Um, and that is you know, something you get by having an SDN controller. But equally, there are other cases where, yeah, we have integrated the two so that the customer can do dynamic stuff in open daylight that's topology related, but let the TLF NSO solution do the actual provisioning part. So for example, with segment routing, we're looking at models where you need to figure out all the labels to impose at ingress and send to egress, but you want the TLF solution to do that. But how does it know what those, what those labels are? Well, it knows because Open Daylight is running BGPLS and is talking to the network and learning the labels. And so it can fetch those labels from Open Daylight and then use them. So they're very, they are very, very complementary. And I try and avoid this kind of who sits on top of the other one argument. It's just like, they work together. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? So you may have addressed this. I wasn't exactly able to hear you. Yeah, you have the same problem I do. <laughs> yeah. With the able to hear. Um, so I understand the service provider adoption and, and that model and that mindset. Is there a, an enterprise business case that you've personally witnessed that you can give an example for? You know, a, a um, you know large organization who has embraced this and uh, committed to substantial development internally in order to, to roll something out. What is the application? What's the, the problem you're trying to address with mm -hmm. Open Daylight? So I, I, I spoke to a, well, I spoke to a couple of companies, but both of whom are. Uh, well, they, they, they're not going to want me to say who they are, but they're both large enterprises. 
So they're looking exclusively at doing open daylight to do IT acceleration, because at the moment, they have the same issues as the SPs, right? So they get turnkey solutions. From a Cisco point of view, awesome if we can take the whole business and we are the turnkey solution, but the reality is that's not the case. So they're always gonna have to do some level of integration, and, and they're as tired of it as the service providers. So from an IT point of view, they often have lots of use cases around sort of employee mobility. So a lot of folks, you know, traveling from office to office, they want different security policies, and they, and they want to be able to write small applications very quickly to manage that. So they're looking at ways to kind of pull in identity, pull in policy, consume a lot of the stuff they already have. So, you know, one of the constrictions around that is most of the systems you get from, you know, the vendors, they're not very API friendly. You buy the system and we lock you in and it's awesome for us, but it's not so great for the customer. So you're seeing the same pushback from a lot of those guys as you are from the SPs going, yeah, you've had a nice run with this, but you know, really we, we're not gonna keep playing that game. So I, you're right, it's the enterprises are, they're not slower to move, because I think they think about stuff the same way and at the same time, but the SPs are often quicker to be able to throw out equipment, you know, they're not, you know, unless it's telecoms, which they have their own regulatory environment and makes that harder. But yeah, I'm definitely seeing people, especially today, talking about those types of use cases. The employee mobility one was interesting. I hadn't really thought of it from that point of view. So the idea is you'd run an agent on their device and the agent would phone home to open daylight. And from there, it'd be able to, as Giles said about topology, topology is really just, you know, it's a set of abstracted, you know, links and paths and whatever. So they're looking at, you know, is the guy at home? Is the guy in the office? It's, you know, almost everybody's using VPNs or applications need some sense of distance or purpose. So uh, yeah, no, we're definitely seeing that. Is anything seriously deployed? Um, it probably is, and I don't know what it is, but I, I, I don't know of anything uh, that's actually done. Um, I guess something that's the, it was announced at Open Daylight today is the Hadron Collider guys using Open Daylight. So they're starting to use, I mean, I don't know if we, if we count them as an enterprise or as a, I don't know, but it's, they're definitely not SP. So, you know, they have adopted it. It's not coming as they announced it, and they, they seem pretty happy with it. And we spoke to one of those guys today as well, so, and they have a lot more things they want to do with it. So I think, long-winded answer, but yeah, I think the change is coming. So, thank you for the question, it's a great question. Sorry? No, no joy on video. So maybe, maybe if I show the OpenFlow demo, then maybe, we good? Oh, one more question, sorry, I didn't see that. Just kind of touching on the same question. Uh, we're talking about open daylight. We are talking about NSO, TLF. Where does UCS director factor in? These are all orchestrators, but do you envision an enterprise having all these three platforms for so end-to-end service? I think that's, I think the issue is delivery. the fact that we see them as platforms. I think, you know, that's, I'm going to go off message from Cisco for a moment. Is, it, it, yeah, you describe them as platforms. I describe them as platforms. And that's not really useful anymore. They need to become, I think we've got this stickle block idea, right? If you're not surrounding your platform with a set of APIs where it can be reconsumed, you're going to run into deployment issues as people change their OSS. And uh, you know, again, we're seeing that. We're seeing that pushback from banks, from from SPs, from everybody. So where does it all fit in? Well, you're never going to get one thing, one controller, one orchestrator to do everything. So the question then really becomes around how do you arrange a hierarchy where it all works? Um, it, I move away from the speaker. I think it's feedback. Um, so I think my view is, this is my personal view, is that at the end of the day, people need to start defining their own OSSs that aren't directly related to everything they're going to have to vertically bolt in underneath it. So your requirements become different than they are today. Instead of saying, give me service X and I'll pay integrator Y to, to integrate it, you're going to say, this is my interface that I'm prepared to accept to my OSS. And it will be, you know, here are the APIs and the RPCs I want, and here's the language I want it in. And this is, as Giles has been talking about, Yang. It's one of the reasons why Yang is taking off. I can model a washing machine with it and a router, you know. But in the same way, I can model an orchestrator or a controller with a set of capabilities. So at that point, I can define my APIs in a modeling language and, and end up with a much better OSS. It's, all, all I feel is happening is that we made the switch to sort of, you know, IP many, many moons ago. And we had a lot of disparate protocols, and we settled on one, and we said, this is how we're going to interact. We kind of all screwed it up with different CLIs. You know, we're, we all did it. But, you know, and that's been very unhelpful, but a great lock-in. So, um, but now, you know, the pushback from everybody is we're not interested in that either. Um, and it's, that whole ethos is trickling up to the OSS. 
So to answer your actual question, yeah, I think today, no, it doesn't work well together. But they're all complementary features, and there's no reason why you couldn't turn you know, the orchestrator, the controller for UCS or anything else into something that has some simple APIs. It has all the functionality. So you know, it needs a wrap around it from APIs to make it more consumable. Uh, at, at that point, it's actually easier to sell. So I hope that goes some way to answering your question. Well, let's fire this up, and then maybe th maybe this triggers some questions or or not. Um, uh -huh. Oh, it worked. You're right. So yes, we have we have a live demo. So what I've got here is is um, Open Data Lake just running in an Ubuntu VM on my laptop. Well, on this SSD, I guess. Um, and so when Open Data Lake comes up, there's really again Andrew mentioned about Carafe. By default, it comes up with only a handful of features installed. So the first thing you typically do is install the set of features you need. Um, there's a certain amount of kind of voodoo around figuring that out. Um, one thing I've been wondering is how we can get sort of decent class dependencies out there. Given that um, every feature has dependencies on other features, it should be fairly easy for us to construct a, a tree showing what depends on what and also um, what each one provides. So what I'm looking for here, in, in this case, um, I'm pulling in things like the MD Sal broker um, to get the, all the MD Sal infrastructure and rest comp so I can talk to this from, a, from Postman. And then I've got the OpenFlow plugin um, so that I can actually manipulate OpenFlow. Um, I don't have any switches in my virtual machine, but I do have Mininet. So I'll run Mininet with um, just uh, one switch with four hosts running off it as a very simple demo. Um, one thing to watch out for in terms of as you start playing with this, I mean, that kind of environment, you know, Ubuntu, run Open Daylight within that and run Mininet is a great environment. Um, you need to make sure your Mininet is the latest version that has OpenFlow 1.3 support out of the box, or you'll find bizarre things. We think you're talking 1.3 and you're still only really doing 1.0, and things like address modifications don't work. So always watch out for those kind of things. Um, so having done this, um, if I just do a ping all, so all the hosts are going to try and ping each other, you'll see it fails, because there are no flows at this point in the controller. So if I look in the controller, get the flows, you'll find there's nothing there. Hopefully that's visible. Um, so if I now add some flows, so I'll, I'll add in some ARPs, because um, of course they've got to be able to discover each other. Um, you, you may just want to point out that for those of you not familiar with Postman. Oh, thank you. For those of you not familiar with Postman, it's a really great tool for building sets of APIs, and you can build environments and everything to go with it. So if you're going to speak to the Open Daylight Controller, yeah, you can do it with you know, Python or Curl. You can come up with a myriad of ways of doing it. But for sort of any demonstrations like this, it works really, really well. And what you can see here is the flows that I've just provisioned um, in the config state of Open Daylight. If I wanted, um, so those have come in XML, but if I preferred, I could get them in JSON. Yeah, making these bigger is actually kind of tricky. I haven't really figured that out with the prepackaged client. Um, and you can see that's JSON. But equally, I can get the um, I can get the kind of running stuff on the network. So that's what I configured in Open Daylight. And this is actually pulling stuff from the switches and verifying what they're configured with. And so you find the flip. Oh, I kicked something. Wow. That's really interesting. Oh, yeah, we seem to have lost the screen. That's remarkable. Oh, no, it's rebooting. There you go. It's got oh. some nice leaves on it for some reason. Yeah, it, it thought the room was too bright or something. Who knows? So it's back. Um, so then, um, just to prove it worked, if we ping now, you can now see H1 and H2 you can see each other. Because all I added was a, an art flow and an IP flow from host one to host two and vice versa but nothing for the other hosts. Now, that's obviously kind of a pain to run. And what, one, of the, um, one of the other things we have in Open Daylight, for example, is a, an application that just gives you a layer two switch. So the application itself implements Mac learning and spanning tree and the rest of it. So you can deploy that app if you want. And then you know, at that point, things will discover themselves automatically. Um, but it can be quite fun to, you know, to figure these things out for yourself and write those apps. Um, as I say, personally, OpenFlow, it's it has niche use cases. I don't think it's generally what you'd use for your LAN WAN. But you know, if you have, um, for example, across a, a data center network, if you want to set up elephant flows and be very deterministic about the paths they take, 
to avoid packet loss, then OpenFlow is a great way to do that sort of thing. Um, in the wide area, we can do very much similar stuff using BGPLS and PSET, where BGPLS learns the IGP topology, and PSET using MPLS provisions paths across it. Um, and I guess that's the sort of unique thing in a sense with Open Daylight, is just how open it is to different southbound plugins. So again, in contrast to a traditional SDN controller that's all about OpenFlow, we take again the TLF NCS, now in NSO platform, very much focused on configuration. I guess what we're doing here is a much broader spectrum. Like the price you pay for that is probably the fact that out of the box, what you get is kind of a framework that you have to work with. Whereas, you know, to the enterprise question, I think in general, you know, we see enterprises more likely to use APIC EM, where out of the box they get something that already knows how to configure Cisco routers. And so they have apps built into it immediately ready to go. Whereas with this, it's much more a case of, here's the framework, think about writing apps on top of it. Which is why, I guess one of the reasons why we see it more in the SP space than the enterprise, is they tend to have more developers available. Charles, do we want to sort of talk about the open source aspects of this and sort of maybe get some questions on that? I guess, you know, maybe to some of you it seems odd in a way that Cisco is pushing the open source thing so much, if you know our sort of history. Um, I guess our team perhaps were unusual in that we're very much driving open source. Um, and there are things like, I mean, Charles brought you about OpenStack and open data, how it kind of fits together. Do you still have the slides available or? We should do. Oh, Andrew's got them. I mean, I think just to point out one of the things about open source and why, you know, open daylight being open source, I think is a, a really big deal. If you think back to the original picture that was shown, it showed, uh, you know, you had this controller with a bunch of APIs on the northbound side, and then on the southbound side, we've been talking about different plugins. We mentioned uh, uh, you could use OpenFlow, you could use NetConf, you could use uh, BGP. Uh, the great thing about it being open source is that there are so many things that are supported on that southbound side. And if something that's really critical to you or your company or for some use cases needed, it can be contributed to the open source community uh, into open daylight. You're not limited to whatever your particular vendor says, you know, oh, we don't like open flow, we like these other things, therefore we're not going to support open flow. No, that's not the case. Anyone can add code to it because it's an open source project. And that's why I think you see such uh, great support on the southbound side for all these different things. Um, 